When I was in the fifth grade, my mom bought me a cheap $75 violin from the pawn shop so that I could play in the school orchestra. And I was so excited about this violin. See, we grew up poor in the Edge Hill projects of Nashville, long before that area became what it is today. And that amount of money on an instrument was an incredible stretch for a single mother of four young girls. And to me, that violin was priceless. But when I took it to orchestra class, my instructor looked at it and told me, it's unlikely this instrument will take you very far as the quality isn't very good. So at that moment, I became like that violin, unlikely to be any good or go very far. So I quickly learned that how you dress, what your name looks like on your resume, and the degree that you have on your wall determines your value to others. And that value has a prescribed look and a sound and a face, a face that didn't look like mine. I was always interested in science and thought that maybe one day I would be an inventor or an astronaut like Mae Jemison, or maybe discover something new like the characters on Star Trek. But I figured that to get there, I would need multiple advanced degrees, and that costs a lot of money. And that's money that neither I nor my family had. And it was my understanding that the latter rungs of education, from getting your associates all the way up to your PhD, the assumption was that you can only be respected if you climb those ladders. And by doing so, it allowed you to foster collaborations with other scientists, create your own niche area of research, and publish in journal journals. But was that the only way? I mean, I thought so, but it turns out that my journey wasn't going to go that route. I think our understanding of scientific progress hinges a lot on the concept of the power of the individual. We think that science and, you know, Advances in science are made by this single solitary genius, like Tony Stark in Iron Man. So, but that's not, really, that's not really it. Or maybe we think of another scientist or an inventor like Thomas Edison, who we commonly attribute to the discovery of the light bulb, when in actuality he just improved upon the current idea of the time. But, Edison held over 1,000 patents, including one for the telegraph stock ticker, the movie reel, and the phonograph. So, one would think that someone who had created all of these great inventions would be the product of some sort of Ivy League education. Or maybe he graduated the top of his class and went to work at some great engineering firm. Well, in actuality, Thomas Edison was homeschooled for the majority of his life, for his childhood. And then after that, he was self-educated. He didn't go on to get an advanced degree, but instead he chose to work as a telegraph operator, which actually fueled his interest in how things worked. So I would call him an unlikely inventor because his educational background shouldn't have warranted such great success. And later on in his life, he employed a chemist, not an engineer or an inventor, he employed a chemist by the name of Martin Rosanoff, who famously said of the inventor following his death, that had Edison been formally schooled, he wouldn't have the audacity to create such impossible things. So was Edison the exception to the rule, the rule that you have to have this certain academic pedigree in order to be successful? Or is the rule simply untrue? And what gives someone the audacity to find their own way in science? What makes someone qualified to be able to participate in something great? I begin to think that being audacious is actually what makes someone great. Take, for instance, Katherine Johnson. She graduated from West Virginia State College, which was a historically black college. She got her bachelor's degree in mathematics and French and later went on to work for NASA as a computer in 1953. 
And at that time, computing work was left to women and the engineering work was left to the men. But here she was, asked to look over the calculations prepared by computers and men with more power and privilege than her. And during her lifetime, she experienced segregation, racism, sexism, and educational elitism that is present in some scientific circles and is still present today. But there she was, with her bachelor's degree, being called upon to verify the calculations done by these computers and prepared by these men. And given her educational background, it would seem unlikely that she should even have a seat at the table. But when computers were used for the very first time to calculate a manned rocket orbiting the Earth, John Glenn refused to go unless Katherine Johnson, a young African-American woman with just her bachelor's degree, checked the numbers first. I would say her journey was highly unlikely. As for me, this is how I pictured my journey. I pictured that I was going to graduate from undergraduate school with a 3.5 GPA. I was going to complete several summers of a well-respected internship and then maybe go on and get my master's or PhD. Well, that didn't happen. I ended up graduating from undergraduate school with a 2.98 GPA, did absolutely no internships, and joined the Navy, in the in, joined the United States Navy in their Naval Nuclear Power Program. Now, the Navy is where I got a lot of experience dealing with radioactive materials. It's where I got to learn about reactor theory, reactor power, heat transfer and fluid flow, and reactor and steam plant chemistry controls. But it's also where I learned where educational elitism allows someone to think that they're better than you just because of the degree that is hanging on their wall. So while I was honored to serve my country and thankful to be able to travel, I definitely felt like my journey was leading me elsewhere. So later, I applied for a job as a radiochemical technician at Oak Ridge National Lab. And there I got a lot of experience processing and purifying isotopes such as berkelium, and curium, einsteinium, uranium, plutonium, all the, all the actinides and some of the lanthanides. But I still felt like I needed to get my advanced degree because I could only go so far with what I had. And I surely didn't think I was going to be a part of something big. But within two years of working there, I found out that I was going to be a part of something really big. So one thing that I took from the military and I, I kind of incorporate into my life now is that success belongs to the team. There are no solitary individuals. We, we like to idealize this concept of this solitary genius, like the Tony Starks of the world in a lab with an ocean view. But we fail to recognize the people behind the scenes that help bring scientific ideas to fruition. And these people come from all sorts of backgrounds. And some of the smartest people I've actually worked with either didn't have a degree or just had their associate's degree. So we can't hinge our perception of what someone's intelligence is based off of that piece of paper. After the military, I moved on to Oak Ridge National Lab, and there's a lot of collaborative work that goes on in the lab. And there's a lot of people working together to find new elements on the periodic table to expand what we know about the universe. And this involves lots of organizations and lots of people working together to make those things happen. So I was working with two other women, and we were probably the only women at the time in that facility. There's a lot more now. But we were working for months on what was to be a huge scientific discovery. We spent months poring over calculations, preparing reagents, putting items in the glove box, going over everything over and over and over again so that we could purify berkelium-249. And this berkelium-249 material was to be used as the target to make 
seven atoms of element 117, which is one of the newest elements that has been discovered. So I thought it highly unlikely that there had never been an African-American woman that had been involved with element discovery. I mean, surely there had been somebody by now. I mean, we already had James Harris, who was the first African-American man to be involved with element discovery. But this year, I was privileged to be announced as the very first African-American woman to be involved with element discovery. And that was for my work, along with others, for the confirmation of element 117, also known as Tennessee, after this great state. <laughs> now, I always say this was definitely a collaborative effort. There are no big I's and little U's. And the team that collaborated to work to discover element 117 comprised of individuals, scientists, and engineers from Oak Ridge National Lab, Joint Institute of Nuclear Research in Russia, the University of Las Vegas, Nevada, Vanderbilt University, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and the Research Institute for Atomic Reactors in Russia. It's a lot of people. And so here I was, in the middle of all these engineers and scientists with their masters and PhDs, and I was taking my seat at the periodic table with them. <laughs> so who would have thought that this girl from the projects would go on to be a part of something great? I mean, I definitely didn't think it would happen. I didn't have the right grades. I didn't have the right clothes. I just didn't feel like I had anything right. And just like that violin, I felt like I was unlikely to go very far. I was the unlikely scientist. But do you know what happened with that violin? I made orchestra first chair every single year that I played that violin. In my naval career, I graduated as a top recruit from boot camp and in the top 10% of my class from Naval Nuclear Power Training Command. And in my career, <laughs> thank you. And in my career, I saw myself go from a technician to a research assistant to the project manager for industrial use isotopes at Oak Ridge National Lab. And I've also been privileged to be a part of several very big research projects with NASA and with other national labs for collaborative research efforts. So, just like that violin and with my life, I poured everything into it. I poured my heart and soul into that violin because I saw it as an extension of who I want it to be. And years later, when my orchestra instructor came up to me, she told me, you may have had a cheap violin, but the way you played it made it sound like it was worth a million dollars. And that meant a lot to me because I took everything in my life like that violin because everything that you do, people will always underestimate you for it. They'll look at you and say you're unlikely to do this or you're unlikely to, the, to do that. But if you pour your heart and soul into it like I did, you're destined to succeed. And that's how I took everything in my life. I was destined to succeed because I had no other choice. So, whether it is a degree or a cheap pawn shop instrument, it's not about the quality of the instrument, but how well you play it. So make beautiful music with what you have. Thank you.